Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. You know, a week or so ago, I uh, began the program by discussing the issue that people often ask who are the most common, especially clergy who come to the Catholic Church. And I had said at that point that maybe the most common um, usual suspects are Episcopalians and Anglicans, and then surprisingly, the second biggest group are Baptists, of all things. Well, if you look at the other extreme, who are the rarest? Well, I would say that amongst the rarest who come to the church are the Amish and the Mennonites. And I'm not exactly sure why. I got some suspicions. Maybe we'll talk about that tonight because our guests tonight are former Mennonites, which I'm excited to have, especially because I wrote that book on life from our land, trying to understand how to live the gospel out in the rural life. We're going to talk with some Mennonites tonight, former Mennonites. Kurt and Judy Ashburn, former Mennonites, and their website, we'll talk about it later, is campoakhillpa.org. I'm excited to find out about that. Welcome to the journey home, both great. of you. Nice Thank to be here. Thank you very much. It's great to have you here. Good to be here. Awesome to be oh, here. Oh, I'm, uh, wow, 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 wow. Yeah. But as I, I started to talk about Mennonites, but as you mentioned a little bit before, uh, like so many other non-Catholic Christian traditions, there's a lot of different layers and shapes of Mennonites and Amish, right? Yes, very much so. Yeah. All right, well, since I have two of you on there, I've really got to be quiet to let you have the, the time. So where do you want to begin with your journeys? Well, she's the one who was raised in the Mennonite church. I think maybe if she, okay. she begins, I was grafted in later. All right, great. Judy. Well, you know, Mark, it's the, God has been wooing me. through. He has been wooing me with his love through Jesus. <laughs> into the Catholic faith for since the foundation of the world, really. I mean, by the time I was age five, I remember asking my mother if she would pray with me that I could accept Jesus into my heart. And uh, having come from very um, a strong ancestry of Swiss, German, Mennonite background in both mother and father, and growing up on a farm in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. So what a gift. Yeah, in the midst of it. Yeah. Right in the, the midst Mecca. of it. And it was such a gift, really, to have that foundation early yeah. on because the people we work with now and we see in the city, many do not have that strong foundation. Yeah. And so by the age of five, to be able to ask Jesus into my heart. And from there, I, I worked the fields with my dad. We had 6,000 chickens, gathered eggs. And by the time I was 13, which is about the time that most of us joined the church at a revival meeting, and we, um, as, as women, we wore coverings, and not only to church, but I attended a public school. Yeah. And so I remember the day in, in sixth or seventh grade, I walked in with that covering on my head. And at that point, I didn't have the same friends I had the day before. And the covering when you joined the church? Yes. Yes, okay. So I joined the church, and with that, we were to wear the covering. Now, nowadays, it's not so much mm. a part of the faith as it was back in the um, 60s. Mm. And so when I wore that covering to church, it was um, a lot of social consequences behind that. But I also noticed in myself that I started thinking my of myself as, as having a radical faith, that I was that this was okay to love Jesus and I may have to suffer for it, but that's okay. And it did have social implications later in high school. And I, I think there were some vulnerabilities there, just wanting to fit in, belong somewhere. And uh, so that was some, some difficult times in my, in my high school years. Was it hard also because you're in this radically different tradition, but you're not just isolated in that tradition. You're with public school. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden you're thrown into the complication of that. Mm -hmm. right? And there were other Mennonites there. I yeah. didn't necessarily identify with them so much. Like I would get a note from my mother saying I could participate in square dancing in gym class. <laughs> and the other Mennonites would go to the library. And I, I just still wanted to kind of find my own way. Hmm. Um, a little bit of a rebel, and 
but I left home at, at age 18, went to college. And no. uh, I didn't know that that was in the tradition of the men and I know the it's, Amish are not. No, it yeah. wasn't. I had to actually like kind of rebel to, I mean, I, yeah. I, I remember very distinctly, um, very uncomfortable conversation with my father about yeah. I'm, I'm going to leave and, and go to school. He had an eighth grade education and my mother was the first to graduate um, from high school in her family. Yeah. So education wasn't necessarily, further education right. wasn't seen as necessary. But when I went to college at Shippensburg University, I, in the first week, discovered a, a charismatic uh, Christian fellowship there. And that's where I met Kurt. And um, it added a whole new dimension to my faith. So yeah. again, the wooing of Jesus, yeah. because then it was a, like a personal relationship and it involved my whole like affect and emotion and that really didn't come into play so much in my earlier years. Okay. So that um, brought a whole new dimension in and then we met, got married um, when I was 20, um, still in college. And then my father was killed in a tractor accident soon after we were married. And most dangerous place in America, farms and Yeah. yeah. It was very painful for our family, but mm -hmm. it was during that time and Kurt, you may want to pick up from here because he was discerning what, oh. what seminary he wanted to go to. And when I met him and uh he had been going to the Naval Academy and uh he he um when I, when I brought him home with me to meet my mother after we started dating, I'll let him pick up the story from there. Well, I, I, I was going to do one question yeah. here. <clears throat> Jesus from the beginning. Yeah. Jesus. And Jesus. not Catholic. Not Catholic. Mm -hmm. I mean, no. there's no openness, no. not even on the chart. No, no. You would think about it. You would think about no it. No awareness, yeah. consciousness. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Well, I can pick up on that part of the story, and I take it we're both very grateful for the background that we came from our parents. Yeah. Um, I grew up in in a, in a church family, um, but but having not Mennonite, but not Mennonite. I didn't yeah. I didn't know what a Mennonite was, never heard of Mennonite, and then she's <laughs> got, you know, I start talking to her, and she's got chickens at home and all this, <laughs> and uh, and then of course Mennonites uh, are pacifists. And uh, here I come from the U.S. Naval Academy. I, I had uh, been playing football at, at Navy and uh, had an injury and a uh, pretty serious uh, shoulder injury. Was in a half body cast and, uh, and, and really sensed a call from the Lord to go into the ministry. So I, so I left the academy, which was very, very, very difficult. But I didn't leave for any pacifist reasons. <laughs> and so when her mother asked this question, she, the way her mother put it, and I love her mother. Her mother, even when we when we finally become Catholic, in spite of the differences, the love that she shows us yeah. is just Ms. incredible. Yeah. But she says to me, <clears throat> um, "Are you non-resistant?" And I, I'm like, I to me, I thought that maybe it was a part of a radio. Or <laughs> I, I didn't know what that was. And and so Judy's trying to tell me, you know, that what this is about. You know, are you, are you non-violent? And uh, so her mother says something to the effect of, well, if Judy was attacked, what would you do? And, I, and I'm like, well, I'm a chivalrous guy. I mean, I'm a man. I, I, uh, and I'm thinking, I'm telling her mother exactly what she wants to hear about the guy that, that, that's interested in her daughter. And I said, I, I probably said something pretty, like, I, I'd kill him. <laughs> Judy's like, wrong answer. <laughs> so... I, the whole Mennonite thing. Eventually, I become a Mennonite, um, and that that was that was a big change for me. And then, of course, later on, Catholic. But um, but I think important in my upbringing was that because my father was in uh, was in sales, we moved around a lot. So we started in Pennsylvania and <laughs> went to New Jersey, to Dearborn, Michigan, back, uh, and lived several places in Pennsylvania. And each of those places. Even though my father uh, grew up in the Church of the Brethren and my mother grew up uh, Lutheran, when we would get to a new city, they would look for, and, and a lot of Protestants do this, yep. it's not so much about the denomination. Now, they're not going to find a Catholic church. Right. Uh, and there may base. be, you know, they might not be, one of, might not be Episcopal or whatever. But 
uh, you know, high church, but they, they'll find a place they feel comfortable. So over the course of growing up, uh, we were Church of the Brethren, we were Lutheran, we were American Baptist. And so each of these different, different places, we were United Methodist. And then when, uh, when I got to, to college, uh, after, <laughs> after the Naval Academy, um, we, we were, uh, uh, there was a pastor that would come on campus and he was from the Nazarene Church. So not only did we become members of the Nazarene Church there, I think we actually became members, but we, we were attending the Nazarene Church. And uh, I even ended up being a interim pastor at a Nazarene church in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And then we were influenced um, by uh, a United Methodist pastor. So uh, at the Nazarene church, uh, Dan and Jan DeWeese, you know, this uh, beautiful Nazarene uh, who walked into this charismatic Christian fellowship on campus. And then uh, Ted and Lou Yeo from the United Methodist Church. So... All of that Protestant, not just one denomination, but I loved the church. Yeah. I loved the church. Now, when I say the church now, to me, of course, that means something right. you know different. But I love the church. So in our journey, there is nothing, there is nothing negative about why we left uh, or why we became yeah. Catholic. All right. um, and so, uh, so we had, I had all these different experiences. And in one of my vacations um, in, in college, my parents' insurance agent was given a sales pitch at the house, and he sort of picked up. I think my dad was bragging about me preaching someplace, and he invited me uh, to this charismatic uh, prayer and praise, and it turned out to be Catholic charismatic. And <laughs> I remember driving there. And there was a little plastic Jesus on the on the uh, on the on the on the dashboard, and we had came to a sudden stop, and the and Jesus fell off the dashboard. And he kind of <laughs> caught him, and he said, now, he, and, and he taught, and he it was very interesting because he talked to him in a way that I'd never heard anybody refer to Christ before. It was very personal, and um, and 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 that that charismatic fellowship that night hmm. was very significant. Now I go on, and and it, and it takes another thirty years, but but that's where the story goes. Our guests are Kurt and Judy Ashburn. Well, the one thing it seems like you bring into it yourself is you're committed to the church, but no one church. No. But the idea of the fellowship of Christ. Yes. I mean, that's very not not just a me and Jesus. It's it's Absolutely. The, it's the community. So yes. that was a part of it. But you bring to the table a lot of different theologies. I mean, did that ever raise its ugly head during all those years? I mean, you're bouncing between brethren and, right. uh, and uh, you know, the, the brethren and the, um, Mennonites, uh, cool. the Mennonites, and, but you also got the Nazarenes in there and the Methodists and... Uh, you know. Right. Was, was that an issue at all or just really more focused on Jesus and we're all a little bit different? In well, when I, when I felt this call to go into the ministry then, Decisions had to be made about well, what denomination am I going to be in? Because, because this United Methodist pastor had been sort of the most recent influence. Uh, I thought I would uh, end up at Asbury uh, or go up to Gordon Gordon Conwell, and then when Judy shared about her father being killed like six months after our we got married, um, he lived uh, through the night, and at his bedside was a Mennonite bishop. And that Mennonite bishop and I spent, basically spent the night together at the bedside of her father. And he had the most beautiful spirit, uh, Bishop Paul Landis, the most beautiful spirit to the family. And when the night was over and her dad had passed, he turned to me and he said, will you do one thing for me? And I said, I will do anything for you for what you just did. And he said, would you be willing to visit Easter Mennonite Seminary before you make a decision? So the death of her father really then yeah. was the catalyst for me to say, yes, let's go visit. Well, I never ended up visiting Asbury. I never ended up at Gordon Conwell. We went down to Harrisonburg, Virginia. We left there with an apartment, a teaching job for her, and me all set for, to go to seminary. And, uh, and, and, and so... 
and so my theological education began there, mm. and that's when I began to deal with where I was, where, you know, where, where am I now theologically? Yeah. Because I wasn't thinking theologically as I was growing right. up, but now I had to make those decisions. Yeah. And, and so now we're at Eastern Mennonite and she's teaching and gets to know uh, Esther Augsburger very well, another teacher. You were bringing all those chickens with you. No, left the chickens at home. <laughs> <laughs> so the farm, the farm, because of her father dying, the farm had to be sold. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that and that was tough. That happened some years later, but um, I was a business teacher that lasted uh, about a year at Eastern Mennonite High School, and I changed professions somewhere in there, but um, to counseling and, and went on mm -hmm. to James Madison University to pursue a counseling degree. But I became friends with Esther Augsburger and her husband Myron was the, the uh, president of Eastern Mennonite University at that time. Mm -hmm. And she was the art teacher there at the high school. And as we, we also met three African-American leaders, uh, reconciliation was their, what they were committed to in DC. We met them in the late 70s. And so the, the, our faith journey started taking a little bit more of a social justice kind of mm -hmm. approach. Uh, we were very attracted um, to these leaders because they would bring all kinds of <clears throat> different people together. So they could be with Desmond Tutu in South Africa one week and Jerry Falwell <laughs> the next. And how are we all going to come together in loving each other? Because the message was very simple. Uh, we had taken a group of students to the city, and I was very comfortable, like, painting the bathroom, even though I was painting on wallpaper that had been there several layers, and it wasn't really how I grew up learning how to paint. But <laughs> John Staggers would say to me, just, just go out and hang on the stoop and talk to people. I felt very uncomfortable. Yeah. I was not raised in a diverse, with any kind of diversity, really. I mean, I had lots of aunts, uncles, and cousins, and we all believed and lived kind of the same way. So different races, economic levels, certainly the city life, very different from country. And so I um, didn't ever want to move to the city. And Kurt would ask, and mm -hmm. I'd say no, no. But we were so drawn because, again, mm -hmm. their message of reconciliation and of yeah. Jesus loves me, this I know. And I sang that in Sunday school, <laughs> for the Bible <laughs> tells me so. And so that was a common theme. And so social justice, caring for the poor, we have lots of different labels for them, the marginalized, the disenfranchised, the addicted, chronically many ill, homeless. And, uh, and we, we kind of had to find our own way in the social gospel as well, because Jesus also, in addition to caring for the poor, I, I found I had a hard time caring for the rich. And we kind of reached both ways when we went there eventually and moved to DC. And that was my own heart that I had to do some work on. So, you want to yeah, so, talk about so the church? So I was going to say that uh, you know the, the scriptures, beginning to end, talk about the need to take care of the poor, the widows. It's there, mm -hmm. and the harshest words are often for the rich because yeah. yeah. they've been given resources yeah. that they're to share. Right. I mean, it's it's right there, mm -hmm. all the way through. But a, a good portion of Christianity kind of doesn't know what to do with that. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody hurts. The rich hurt. The poor hurt. Yeah. We have different ways of hiding it. Myron, um, Dr. Augsburger, invited us, invited us to um, <clears throat> go to Washington D.C. with him. We had already committed to going to to Washington, but we didn't know how we were going to be supported. We were going to go there and work with these men that Judy was talking about with the homeless. And uh, Myron came to us and said, "Look, I've been asked to go and start a church on Capitol Hill." And would you be the associate pastor? And and we said yes. I, we would we would join you as long as we have the freedom to continue to work with the poor. And so uh, um, Myron is very well known in the Mennonite Church. And uh, so th there was a lot of notoriety around this church starting on Capitol Hill. And um, and I was the associate pastor there for for five years. And after that, moved on to pastor a smaller uh, Mennonite church. 
Um, during that time, um, we had two sons. And uh, then later, after um, late 80s, when we um, uh, started our, I'd started a nonprofit ministry, and we were working, uh, I was working on putting learning centers into low-income housing units. Wow. And then we, then we found this property uh, up in Lancaster County. Her mom found it. And so after having lost the farm after her father died, here we had this opportunity um, through our nonprofit ministry to buy this 50-acre campground. And we did that so that we could take kids to, to, this, to the country. Wow. And we did that for about for 14 or 15 years. Every summer we would take uh, 40, 60 kids uh, each week. And so then uh, we also uh, had a daughter at the end of uh, the eight, uh, late 80s. And she is the one that led the way to the Catholic Church. So at this point in time, even though you're more involved with social action, right. social work, you're not really getting connected yet with any of the Cat Dorothy Day or any of the mm. Catholic voices. No, 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 mm. no. Mm. Um, and so, so, so really, um, our our stories, Rebecca's story, Judy's story, and my story, we were on, we were on three different tracks. <laughs> uh, Judy and I had uh, we had gone through a, a difficult time in our marriage. And we were and we were separated for about a year and a half back in uh, 2004, 2005. Oh. And during that time, um, you know, well, we had we had put our children into Catholic schools, even though we aren't Catholic. You're not even thinking about that, but it, no, there we go. But 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 the D.C. public schools are not a place for our children no. to be in uh, their high school years, and so. So one went to DeMatha Catholic, and I went there and was teaching there and coaching football. And uh, our other two went to Bishop O'Connell over in Virginia. And, um, uh, and, when our, and when our daughter was there, she was greatly influenced by the, ca the, Catholic, the Catholic influence there really affected her. She ends up going into the Catholic Church in 2008. Because of what she's learned. Because of what she has learned there. Judy, after us going through our marital struggles, she ends up going to our local Catholic church, which was right around the corner, like two blocks from us, and she needs to tell that part. And then in 2000, she comes into the church in 2009, and I come into church in 2010, and I had done it on my RCIA at the Cathedral Church in D.C. because we were all seeking something and we all found it in the Catholic Church and we found it completely separate from each other. <laughs> and she just reminded me this morning, you wanted to say about the Scott Hahn book? So we were, I found out we were all reading the same book, Rome Sweet Home by Scott <laughs> Hahn, all at the same time. But he was in Philly and Becca was in Philly and uh, I was in D.C. and. It was that well, How book. did that book fall into your lap? I mean, it's not one you would pick up on your own usually, but... I don't even know. I don't, I don't know. know. I was reading I Merton. It. I mean, I did have okay. some, I had sort of a mystical bent, so we, 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 we did a lot of reading in Merton and other mystics. Okay. And I don't know how we ended up okay. with Scott Hahn's book, but we all three were reading at the same time and mm -hmm. did not know that. <laughs> and that book was really pivotal in my coming to the Catholic faith. And But I also was... At that time, um, it was a very, very painful time in, in certainly our family life and in my professional life, too, because by 2005, I had already been working in the field of treating drug addiction, the mentally ill, and the homeless in Washington, D.C. Wow. And that, with a social gospel, it was very, uh, felt very empty, despairing, mm -hmm. and though some people would find their way out. There was a lot of death, um, institutionalization, mental health, recidivism, recidivism rates were high. And so it was kind of a empty seeking time in my life. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting on the porch swing and I just decided to walk around the corner. 
an African-American Roman Catholic church in my neighborhood, lived there for 20 years, never walked in that church. And I walked in and I started weeping. And to this day, I will <laughs> remember that because I, weeped ev I wept every Sunday. Huh. And I would walk in and the Sisters of Sod Sodality would, would bring tissues, and, but it was the Holy Spirit. He mm. was comforting me, He was consoling me, He was uh, saying, you're, you're home, you're home, mm. you found home. Father Ray East is just the most humble, joyful <laughs> priest that I, he, he also was very welcoming. And I found out that I desired between one Sunday and the next, I, I had to get back. Mm -hmm. And I had never felt that deep desire before of I have to be in church. It wasn't something I crossed off a list or I had to do out of duty, but I had to be there. So the hunger and thirst for the Mass, mm -hmm. the liturgy was very deep. Was this at the same time you were reading the Hans book? Yes. Okay. All around that time. So they're filling in some of the gaps of the information of what you're experiencing? Yes. Yes. And I just kept going back Sunday after Sunday because I knew that there was something here that it was so deep and so rich that I had never experienced yeah. before. But the common thread through the whole thing was the, the wooing of Jesus' love. For me, and I could, I knew that it was a deeper, richer experience. Did you know? Was it at the time? Did you know that your daughter was being wooed in that direction? I well, she went to Temple University and was very involved there at the Newman Center. Oh, okay. So I knew that she was increasing her involvement with the Catholic Church. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. But this was also a time when you two were separated. Yes. Okay. So yeah. you're going through this, and mm -hmm. and the emotional, uh, spiritual reality of that. Mm -hmm. And you're way over and. And I'm not being the man that that I wanted to be. I wasn't being the father that I wanted to be. A lot of pain. And uh, eventually, um, uh, Judy took me back, uh, invited me back home. One of the things that, for whatever reason, I had felt theologically, you talk about uh, just, just this whole theological development, more from more from the idea of you know I have interaction with Catholics or people who are, have questions about Catholicism, and I don't really know anything about the the theology. So I thought, well, for just theological integrity, I should learn. Hmm. Well, so I bought the Catholic Catechism. I'm like, I don't know, four pages in. Like, this is all scripture. Yeah. I mean, I was. Because I had that typical Protestant right. misconception that Catholics don't know anything about the Bible. And of course, eventually, not only is the whole catechism filled with Scripture, the liturgy is all full of Scripture. And I'm thinking, where have I been here? Mm -hmm. but, but again, it wasn't, a, it wasn't a theological change that occurred. It was still much like, like what Judy went through, where because of where I was, I needed... I needed not the not the, the the singing and the dancing and the the beautiful things that happen in at St. Teresa of Avila in our neighborhood. I went down to the cathedral church at St. Matthew's in DC. Mm. I needed the majesty. Mm. I needed the solitude. I didn't want to go into a church and have people asking me to join a small group or come to Sunday school. I I needed the I needed the incense. I needed I needed God's greatness. I needed something to overcome and, you know, bring me back to being the man that I always talk to people about as a coach. This is this is what it means to be a man, and I wasn't being that man. And I was beginning to find that then in my exploration of the Catholic theology. All right, let's pause there, my friends. All right, we'll take our, our break that we need to, and uh, we'll come back in just a moment with more of the story of Kurt and Judy Ashby.
Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest tonight are Kurt and Judy Ashburn. You know, when you go to the CH Network website, there's something unique you'll find there, chnetwork.org. We've got a lot of conversion stories on the website, but there's a search mechanism that you can click and say, give me all the conversion stories of Methodists, or give me all the conversion stories that we have of Mennonites. And then you can read story after story after story of former Baptists or Presbyterians or Mennonites, uh, Mormons, and you can do that search on the website. And you can even search, give me all the conversion stories that deal with justification or sola scriptura, because if that's an issue, or Mary, and we've, we've empowered our website to be able to bring that information to you. So please check out chnetwork.org. All right, Kurt and Judy, okay, we paused there. You're, you're up to your shoulders in the catechism, mm -hmm. Scripture. I mean, it really is amazing. It's a beautiful, mm -hmm. beautiful, mm -hmm. not just Scripture, but the, the flow of the thought builds and builds. It's a wonderful. Are you into that at all in your journey? So I read the catechism, too, because I wanted to know. And you're not yet together, back together no. yet. Okay. No. Okay. No. So I read the catechism, and I, I mean, initially I just had some feelings about the Anabaptists being martyred by Catholics, Lutherans, like that's something our Catholic martyrs. audience may not realize, but there really is a tradition amongst the Anabaptists that they carry with them the memory mm. of the way they were treated. Mm -hmm. And yeah. there was a big fat book, The Martyr's Mirror, and we would read these really grotesque, like gruesome stories from there. And so I, I, I was trying to reconcile that. I had. Uh, some challenges with Mary and papal yeah. succession and uh, purgatory. And uh, so I was reading with an open mind and I found a lot of scripture, but I also was given a lot of mercy and grace to yeah. kind of develop and just remain open. But not that I had to accept everything like hook, line, and sinker right away. And Mary in particular, um, I would go to Mass, uh, the Missionaries of Charity have their contemplative prayer house right beside St. Wow. Teresa of Avila. And so I would go to daily Mass there. And I remember one time looking at, at the statue of Mary and um, saying that I had a hard time with you being my mother. I just couldn't accept that belief. <laughs> And because um, that Catholic statue was not like the statues you had in the Mennonite church, right? <laughs> but you <laughs> look long and hard for it. Yes, right. and the statues. Uh, it was really, really difficult. And but it is so, so different now. And I still have like a long ways to go. But I really needed like when you're a mother and, you know, given birth to our three children, two of them at home and just the beauty of that experience, John, Matt and Rebecca. Um, it's, um, it's amazing as a mother to look and to get to know the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ yeah. and who she exemplifies as woman. And I grew up on the farm, like I'm a bit of a tomboy and a little rough and tumble. And I feel like I need like a lot of grace and humility. And I need, <laughs> I, I just, I need, I need Mary to be my mother. Um, and so I've certainly uh, done that invitation in a, you know, a, as I went along, I became more and more open. So and recently we read Dante together. And so the oh, whole wow. purgatory, just dealing with all of that. And yeah. So Oops, grateful for we're always uh, working at, still working at. Anthony es Esselin's uh, oh, yes. uh, translation of, of Dante's Divine Comedy and then his, his, train his uh, seminars on that, that we yeah. listened to. It took it us is. about a year, yeah. Yeah. but... Well, it's um, a big book, three books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. It's, it was but great. But often people don't realize that, you know, the problem with purgatory is really a, a different understanding of sin. Yeah. The, the effect that sin has, a lingering effect that sin has. Even if you're forgiven, there's a lingering effect. Well, in your, in your background, mm -hmm. that isn't part of your theology. Mm -hmm. right? So purgatory doesn't fit. Though I was experiencing it because I was experiencing guilt on the one hand, which can be forgiven, but shame is not something that necessarily gets forgiven. It's something that you feel. 
and so there was this there was this deeper this deeper need and even though my exploration was theological um a, a big part of what drew me was the real presence now coming to a place where where i believed that there really was you know this really was the body and blood of jesus christ was 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 one thing but again it was the experiential hmm. what happens when you actually walk into the presence of christ which is which again is different and so there were things about the there were things about the catholic church that as a as a coming out of the out of the protestant church and having been a pastor hmm. where on the weekdays you have office hours but in the catholic church you have mass and every day every hour of the day somewhere in the world the mass is being celebrated and it's not about office hours monday through friday <laughs> and and so this this then the, the real presence was something that sort of transformed the idea of sanctuary. You didn't go places and have a, a sanctuary that doubled as a gymnasium. There was there were there was a holiness. There was a, a reverence. So the the th the most powerful example for me is is really only happened just what three months ago. Our son is in a is in a a, a rock band. Hmm. Uh, they're all, it's made up of uh, Gordon, Gordon um, um, graduates, great young men, and they travel the world. And our oldest son, Jonathan, uh, was in the Ukraine. Hmm. And, uh, and I was going through the bank ATM, bank teller, drive-through. Drive and just as I pulled out, I got a phone call from Judy. And she said, Jonathan's had a stroke. Your He's son? only 35 years old, Lord, 36 Lord, years old. Lord, Lord. And it was the worst thing I'd ever heard. Yeah. And I could take you right to that spot, right to that place. And here's what I knew. Hmm. I knew the Sacred Heart Church was, was, was five minutes away. Hmm. And I knew that when I got there, it wouldn't be about office hours. I knew that when I got there, I would be able to enter the sanctuary. I went in. There was some cleaning staff there. I said, I need to go in and pray. Yeah. Just a normal thing. Um, my son had a stroke in Ukraine. Wow. You know, 35 years old. So the whole way to the church, the whole way to the church, I'm just, all I've said was, My baby, my baby, help my son, help my son, help my son. I didn't know how to pray. But when I got to the church and I walk in the sanctuary and I walk down that aisle and I lay flat on my face before the altar and before, yeah. that's different, yeah. the real presence. And I laid there on my face and I just begged my father in heaven Help my son. Help my son. Now, our daughter Rebecca had had Lyme disease, and that that experience that changed her life because it was no there was no instant healing. Mm -hmm. She gave up. She was a temple from theater, beautiful singing and dancing. She had to give all that up. So you know, you pray for your children, right. and things take a long time, or they don't happen at all. But it just so happens, though, that 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 with with Jonathan, we got a call. Judy and Judy called and was able to talk to him, and he could not talk. He was slurring his words. Oh. And the reason I go on about this is just that this this knowing that I could go down there to Sacred Heart and walk in, and lay on my face and 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 ask the Lord to help my son is a big reason why the Catholic Church, why I'm Catholic now. And within three hours, we got a phone call that 
in transferring him from one hospital to another in the Ukraine. He suddenly stood up and everything was fine. A miracle. And I would have loved it if the same thing had happened with our daughter. You know, this is the mystery. Mm-hmm. Why do certain things happen? Mm-hmm. You know, our second son had an opportunity to, you know, with him to coach with him for 20 years, you know, but, but, and, and our sons are not Catholic, but we became Catholic as adults. So everybody has to make their own decision. Yep. Yep. But our daughter, having beautifully led us into the Catholic Church, really had led the way in 2008. Now we're back together. Judy comes in at St. Teresa of Avila in 2009. I do my RCIA at at, at St. Matthew's of the Cathedral Church, but I come in to St. Teresa's because it's beautiful. Um, that's our home church. And then just, just that example of saying, look, the real presence was there. And so theologically is coming to terms with all those things. That's one thing. But having Mary... Uh, yeah. as, as, as my mother um, in heaven and having the real presence there when my son, when I couldn't do anything. Yeah. You know, your experiences remind me of something. Um, those that are outside the church might say, well, you don't need to go into that church to have Jesus. He's just here. You know? and, and he is. He is. And so the, it, it can be a, seen as a very spiritual thing as opposed to physical. But you know, it's because God knows us mm-hmm. and what we need. The Old Testament, uh, God didn't need those sacrifices. He says, I don't need them. But he knows what those people needed to do yeah. for their relationship with God. Yeah. Those sac- the, given a sacrifice in a bowl wasn't because God needed it, but because we needed to let go of things. Yeah. We needed that let go. The sacrifice was for us. And that's why he says, if you're not doing it with the right attitude, if your heart ain't right, then that sacrifice means squat. Mm-hmm. That's right. For you to change, he's God said, you're not changing me. You're changing you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we can have Jesus. But God knows that the physicality of the Eucharist, the physicality yeah. of the sanctuary, the physicality of all the stuff, yeah. we need that. At that moment. And that's what you were saying. That, that was everything. what brought changed you guys. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you want to, might want to say something about, you know, just the Mennonite Catholic dialogue that's going on. And, oh. So, and, yeah, and it was that. interesting because I, I kind of wanted to call myself, I, I always wanted to retain the Mennonite. It, it's such You're like a my mother. Part. She wanted to be a Lutheran Catholic. Yeah, well, that's what I said. I wanted <laughs> to be a Mennonite Cat. I was like, Mennonite Cat, that's, that's me. It's kind of unique, you know. And then I discover through a newspaper article that my mother gave me that there's an organization called Bridge Folk, which is... Uh, bringing together Mennonites and Catholics in dialogue, and that there was a, a seminar, I guess a retreat, uh, that weekend being held in Lancaster County, which I went and visited. And they have annual retreats, um, it, it, usually in a Mennonite setting, and then the opposite year in a, in a Catholic setting. And it was at um, St. John's um, Monastery in, in Minnesota um, the following year. And we have a son, our son in law was actually there for several years. And so We've visited there as well, but we have been now in in, in dialogue with different members of this, wow. of this um, bridge folk, and I found out other people had the same names for themselves. So there's some <laughs> of us Menno cats out there, you know. But that's that's been interesting uh, dialogue as well. When when the Mennonites and Catholics sit across the table from one another. What becomes the main discussion points, the main issues? I mean, are they the same issues that you had to go through yourselves in making the transition? Well, the social justice, that's, that's where things really come together, that mm. there's a, a, a great uh, similarity there. Mm. Um, one of the things that happen, one of the decisions they have to make is how do we wrap this up at the end? Now, I haven't been there, so I don't want to represent, but... Are we going to have a are we going to have a communion? Are we going to have a love feast? Are we going to have a mass? And so dealing with how do you and I'm not again I don't want to put words in my mouth, but for me the question would be if you're if you're going to be doing reconciliation, does that mean that you're going to ask people to compromise and sort of do this in between thing, or are you going to both say this we need to we we need to work at this and that's where they are. Uh, and I and I and I do think that they didn't decide to have some kind of 
you know, in between nothing. Um, and or, they can't. I mean, to a certain extent, they, right. they can't. Our, John Paul, St. John Paul, when he wrote Ut Unum Sint, talks about our movement towards unity, but it's not a compromise of what's mm. true. We, mm -hmm. And it's, it's not like we, we sit across the table and now let's figure out how we can adjust everything so that we can get, be happy together. Right. No, it's not about that. Right. But it's about helping to understand where we're coming from. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and why we believe, yeah. and it's it's quite a yeah. thing for Mennonites and Catholics yeah. to be doing this. And so again, I don't want to represent Especially healing what's going those on wounds from, from the memories. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. And I w and maybe just to shift the yeah. the topic for a minute for me, because for the past twenty years I've been doing drug treatment with yeah. the um, homeless, addicted, um, chronic mental illness, and. Um, was was mentored by Dr. David Allen, a, a Bahamian resident, a psychiatrist, and his integration really of, of spirituality and psychology got me into uh, working in that field. And some of the hopelessness I was feeling in 2005 was just the social gospel. I, I, I was tired. I was exhausted. I didn't have really any answers. And I, 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 I felt often empty because there was so much, the need was so great, I would feel so overwhelmed and so stressed out, and how could I really be effective and have mm -hmm. positive outcomes and people changing. Yeah. And so um, I feel like this is where the Catholic faith uh, has really equipped me mm -hmm. to be able to show up every day and to continue to uh, have and, and, and create cr uh, effective programs. We have the Only Women with Children program, uh, six-month residential drug treatment in Washington, D.C., and several other programs that uh, a continuum of care at Samaritan Inns where I work. And without going to daily mass, the liturgy of the hours, the communion of the saints, I, I wouldn't be able to do this work. Well, one thing we Catholics believe is that the sacraments really yeah. do something. So yeah. they, 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 they convey, they change us. The well, I wanted to believe, actually, that even before I was a Catholic, I would, want to, I would pretend sometimes that it was the real body and blood. And <laughs> the joy that I had coming into the church in 2009, I can never describe it. It was like the happiest days of my life because I so desperately wanted to believe in my whole being that this was the real body and blood and not just a symbol. And that's what happened for me on that Easter vigil. We've got about seven minutes ago, so I want to make sure, because I'm guessing there might be somebody out there saying, oh, oh, wait a second, I'm glad you brought him into the church, but you were in D.C. and he was in, but now you're here yeah, together. Right. How'd that happen? I mean, for me, I just kept... I just kept working on myself, and I don't know what happened with her. One day, she called me, and well, I guess this is appropriate. And coming home, network. She called me and said, "You can come home," but she had to tell you about whatever it was that was going on because it wasn't because it wasn't because she had total trust in me yet. I know that. And when we came into the Catholic Church, we couldn't say. Hey, I'm good with all this stuff. I, you know, I, I, but, 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 it, but we did have, we did come in saying, you know what? This is the church. Teach us, help us understand. But what was going on in her? So, um, I, I, uh, and this is just the three of us. No one yeah. else is listening. So. Oh, no, right. <laughs> no, <sorry. laughs> no, I, I was very, um, I was very, open to the council and followed uh, the psychiatrist I was working with, Dr. Allen. And he was, he was advising and counseling me. And I do believe that, again, the Lord wooing, I believe he believes in families and yeah. in, in reunification of the family. And though in my heart, like Dr. Allen would tell me I was an angry woman. And I was Mennonite. I was like, I'm not angry. But there's yeah. some kind of anger that's in me that's hidden and it's cold and it's, mm. it's deep and it's locked away and it and it took me about a year and a half. And I, I realized, you know, I am angry. I'm judgmental. I have a lot of ways about me that I need to change. And when I asked him to come home, I was still angry. And I was angry probably for a year, maybe two years. And then? And then 
Dr. Allen asked me to begin to teach his work down at the mission. And then he began teaching. And I began to teach Dr. Allen's work to the mm -hmm. to the homeless. Right. And uh, about a month into teaching that, you know, mm -hmm. I'm home now. Mm -hmm. But it, everything isn't just sort of doesn't feel right quite yet. But mm -hmm. a month into teaching Dr. Allen's work, um, uh, there's a knock at our door at home and. I go to the door, and it's Judy with five Metropolitan Police officers. She had just gotten word that my brother had taken his own life. I have two brothers. Greg was the second one, and he took his own life. Mm -hmm. And then my brother Brad is the, is the younger one. And um, both beautiful men, but, but Greg had been suffering. This was a turning point also because Dr. Allen really was able to come back. My words to Dr. Allen was, I killed my brother. I felt like I had done all this damage to my family, and then because things weren't really right between me and Greg, that I had killed him. And so, uh, so now, 10 years later, we've gone through all of this and working with Dr. Allen. Um, and his work, is, his work is spirit. His work is very spiritually based. He's not Catholic, but he introduced us. He really introduced us to Lectio Divina. He mm -hmm. loves to do that. Mm -hmm. But um, and then and and then now he's been encouraged me to write um, a book because what I do is I theologically interpret his work, mm. and so now I have a book coming out called Soul in Captivity, which is basically the the trauma experience, and the mm. subtitle is um, Scripture trauma and story hmm. on the contemplative discovery pathway, which is Dr. Allen's theory. Yeah. And the whole contemplative part is mm -hmm. very, he, he says, you know, he says, you know, the Catholic Church, he said, you got to get this to the Catholic Church because they're really good on con contemplation. <laughs> Beautiful guy. And so he's had a tremendous yeah. impact on us. Yeah. And, um, and there's been a lot of, a lot of healing, a lot of healing. And more recently I've attended, um, at Divine Mercy University, uh, the tra uh, Center for Trauma and Resiliency, um, and Dr. Benjamin Keyes has uh, an excellent program there. So we're training, he's training laborers. The harvest is, is out there. People really need to know how to um, find help mm. for deep trauma. And so I'm grateful for that program. And Well, something else I was thinking about is that when you came into the church, your marriage would have been uh, reaffirmed. Yes. That's yes. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. In the sacraments of that and the grace of Right. That comes yeah. from that. Uh, uh, let's, let's say there's a Mennonite just happens to be watching TV. I don't know if they have TVs in Mennonite homes, but let's say they're watching this TV. What would you like to say to them about the beauty of coming home to the church? Why they ought to consider making the same journey home? There would have to be uh, an openness. They do have TVs now. We did yep. back in the day. But um, <laughs> there would have to be an openness, a seeking for something deeper, greater, especially with mystery. I mean, mystery calls. Yeah. And if you're open to experiencing the depth of, of, of the confession, of different, um, the scripture is the same in both, yep. in both traditions. There's nothing different. But to be open to seek the heart of God in the 1500 years before Protestantism. Yeah, and I know St. John Paul II, you know, he, he stood up and, uh, and, and, and apologized. Yeah. That there were times in the past that we haven't always done the way the things mm -hmm. we have, that mm -hmm. maybe we've treated our separate brethren sometimes in ways we shouldn't, and we apologize yeah. for mm -hmm. that. Um, so hopefully that brings us more to the table. To mm -hmm. wounded church. It's, yeah, a wounded yeah. Church. church, and as, but as Henry Nowen said, we're also called to be wounded healers. That's right, healers. exactly. You know, yeah, in ways in which we ourselves have been yes. that gifted. I think in, if I listen to both of you, you've both gone through trauma and issues, but yeah. that equips you to be vessels of grace to others, right? Mm. Yes. What about CampOakHillPA.org? Do you still involved with that? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you still have this camp, We have right? a 50-acre camp. It's in Lancaster County. It's a beautiful setting. It's a place where there's a, everyone who comes there, the peace of God is there. Um, it's, we, we rent it out to um, churches, to, um, uh, we get a lot of focus groups, 
and, but we also are beginning to run our own um, workshops and seminars on dealing with trauma from a biblical, scriptural, Catholic perspective. And you can find that on, on the website where you can come and have some time at Camp Oak Hill. All right. Well, thank you great. both for joining us, thank sharing you your much. journey. On it. It's thank great to meet you both. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And those of you watching the program, I hope that Kurt and Judy's journey is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you again next week.